Hi, welcome everyone. Today is November 20th, 2020, and we greetings and good afternoon all. Also, good morning for the ones in the East Coast since uh, the time change. And we in California is four hours, uh, we are four hours ahead. So thank you for accept our invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, the topic today is the Smithifying Copyrights in the Academia. And today's presenter will be Patricia Rodriguez, Helpy, founder of Afterthought Solutions, and will be moderated uh, by Dr. Carlos Morales, our head chairman and president of GTC Connect Campus of Tarrant County College. We would like to recognize uh, the support of Dr. Carlos Morales in helping us coordinating this uh, webinar today. And today we have more than 120 participants registered from 18 institutions in Puerto Rico. We also have eight institutions in the US and one international as follow. For example, in Puerto Rico, we have participants for Ana G. Mendes, Atenas College, Colegio Universitario San Juan, EDP University. We also have uh, Umacao Community College, ICPR Junior College, National Univers NUC University, excuse me, Universidad de Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus, Maya West and Bayamón Campuses, and we also have from Universidad Central del Caribe and our headquarters, Interamerican University of Puerto Rico, in Pajardo Campus, Ponce Campus, Guayama, Metro, Metropolitan Campus, Law School, eh, Arecibo, San Germán, and Bayamón Campuses. Also, we have other institutions in Puerto Rico invited, like Dewey University, eh, Pontificia Universidad Católica, and Universidad del Sagrado Corazón. And in the US, we have uh, participants from California State University, Sacramento. Also, good morning to you. Also from Austin Community College eh, eh, at eh, CUNY. Also we have us from Austin Community, excuse me, from Borough of Manhattan Community College, from CUNY too, and John Jay College of Criminal Justice, all of them in New York. And also we have again from Palm eh, Beach State College, from the Lake Worth Campus in Florida, I Eileen. And also we have from University at Albany in New York too. This is from the SUNY SUNY system, excuse me, and we also have a, our host of the Blackboard Collaborate license that heads up, uh, which is Universidad of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Thank you for your technical support and also for participating in this webinar today. And we have an international member uh, from Universidad de Buenos Aires in Argentina. Welcome. A greetings to all. We hope that this webinar uh, will be of a great benefit to everyone since HEAD's uh, commitment is to support and serve our more than 40 members institutions in Puerto Rico, Latin America, and in the United States, and other institutions and participants interested in these webinars too. Uh, uh, we hope uh, all of our webinars have been open to everyone, so thank you so much for your support and your uh, participation. But before we begin today, topic, we always emphasize that we invite you to use the chat uh, to write your questions. Uh, since our interest is to clarify your doubts about this topic, we ask you to keep your microphones uh, mute to avoid interruptions during the presentation as this webinar is being recorded for your reference and also to share this uh, in our website and also in our social media accounts with the ones who are not able to join us uh, live today. The link of the, the recording, as of the one who have followed us during the webinars know that will be uh, in the same page that you registered, you will find the link of the recording of this webinar, uh, as, as well of the uh, PDF uh, uh, presentation it, uh, that, that Patricia will be sharing off today. So you can download it too. We also remind you that in the next events section of our website, heads.org.org, you can find all the topics that we, we will be offering this semester in English and in Spanish. Uh, since we are almost at the end of the semester, this is the last uh, uh, webinar in English. And the next one that will be the last one of this semester will be in Spanish. And the title is 
cómo transitar el laberinto de la virtualidad en la pandemia. This webinar will be in December 4 eh, at 3 p.m. Puerto Rico time and 2 p.m. Eastern time and will be again eh, through Blackboard Collaborate and will be presented by Marta Mena, directora del programa de formación virtual de investigadores, eh, Secretaría de Ciencia, Tecnología y Pocrado de la Universidad Tecnológica Nacional UTN. Y Faina, y va a ser moderado también por Dr. Eh, Carlos eh, Morales, Head Chair. Eh, finally, participants who are interested in the evidence of their participation, as, as always, the certificate have to be requested by email at info at heads.org. And please write your full name, the date, and the title so we can be able to send you the certificate in the next two weeks. Please allow us two weeks to send you the uh, email uh, with the certificate. And remember that you have seven days from today uh, to request that. Also, if you are interested in continuing education uh, contact hours, you can request that to the Inter-American University uh, uh, certificate, uh, continuing ed office, and the cost is $5 per certificate, and all the instructions and are under the registration form that you complete for this webinar. Now, we are ready to start our webinar, and I am pleased to present uh, Dr. Carlos Morales, Head Chair, who will be moderating the webinar and present our guest speaker today. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Morales, go ahead. Thank you, Jubelkis, and good afternoon to our uh, attendees. We appreciate that you are uh, in attendance this afternoon. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Patricia Ramirez, LP. She is passionate about intellectual property and she holds a bachelor's degree from St. Louis University and a certificate in museum studies and art restoration from the Università Internazionale dell'Arte in Florence, Italy. She obtained a, her law degree at the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Puerto Rico. And uh, these studies fueled her passion to protect and preserve the rights of works and led her to earn a master's in law in intellectual property at the George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC. She began her professional career in the legal department of the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences in Washington, DC. From 2012 to 2017, she served as the director of intellectual property at the uh, Ana Mendez University system where she designed and developed the university's intellectual property policies, best practices, training program, and educational material directed at faculty and administrative personnel. In 2017, she founded After Thought Code Solutions, LLC, through which providing legal and consulting services in the area of intellectual property. She is a Grupo Guayacan collaborator, part of the iCorps Puerto Rico teaching, teaching team since 2018, and a program manager for iCorps since May 2020. She has been a guest on radio and television shows, is a professional speaker on intellectual property, and author a book on copyrights titled Los Derechos de Autor, Custom y Comunos Efectan. Develop and teach continuing education, continued legal education courses approved by the Supreme Court in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. The title this afternoon of our webinar is Demystifying Copyrights in Academia. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague and friend, Patricia Helpi. Patricia, go ahead. Thank you, Carlos. Gracias, Carlos. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's, you know, I'm very, um, I'm very happy that Heads contacted me to offer this talk. On, on copyrights today, and I'm very honored for that. So thank you very much. As many of you that maybe are working from home or have kids, if you see kids running around or walking in the background, don't mind them. They're my kids at home. Um, but today I'm going to be talking to you about demystifying copyrights in academia. And if, as I go along today's presentation, if you have questions, please write those in the chat section or the comment section so that then Kylo or Juvelkis can, you know, inform me of what those questions are and we can be sure to, you know, to answer those and not have anyone leave this seminar with doubts or questions on a certain topic. So, um, I think we should get started then. 
So how do copyrights impact academia? Well, while I was at, you know, as my work as a as IP attorney and working with universities and faculty, typically um, when you say, when you talk to faculty about copyrights and what they can or they can't do, generally, you know, you hear things like, oh, but I'm only using less than 10% or less than 15 seconds, or I can use that because it's for educational purposes or under fair use, I can use it. Um, it's a couple of pages out of the chapter. Um, so, so we hear a lot of these things, which typically is sort of the way things had been done in the past. Um, but just because that's the way things have typically been done doesn't mean that that's the legal way to do it. Because there are certain things that we're going to discuss in today's webinar that is the customary way of doing things at university, or we do it by uso y costumbre. But doesn't mean that you know that doesn't mean that it is um, abided by the the legal aspect. And the law might sometimes say different things. In these last ten years, technology has advanced greatly. And the thing with um, technology and the law, especially copyright law, is they're not always at the same pace. Copyright law the, has been around you know, since the early 1800s. The last time there was a big change to copyright law was in 1976. And a lot has happened since 1976. Technology today it's not the same as it was in 1976. And even though since then, there have been amendments and changes to copyright law through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the Sono Bonisono Act, there have been changes trying to, to speed up the law, put it to par with technology, but still there is a big gap between what we can today technologically do and what the law allows us to do. So just because technology allows us to do a big array of things and we can change things from format and we can copy and paste and we can download and we can save as easily with just a few clicks of the mouse does not mean that you know that it is that it is available or that we can actually do that. And one of the main things that this is important for for universities is to make sure that the university is not sued by something that we do without even giving it two thoughts, or by something a professor has done. In the last years, there have been a lot of legal suits against universities in this area. And I'm, bringing, I'm gonna be bringing up three of the most notorious cases in this area. For example, the first one is the author skills versus Hathi Trust. And here, this case is mainly you know, related with Google and Google Books and what we can access through there. Um, Google started this movement to have universities um, digitize their collections. And the Authors Guild was saying, whoa, you can't do this. You can't digitize collections of libraries, even if it's university libraries, because us as authors have rights we have copyrights that protect us from having individuals reproduce or duplicate our works. And Google or the Hathi Trust was saying, the Hathi Trust was a consortium comprised of various university libraries. They were saying, but we're doing, you know, this is for educational purposes. This is um, fair use of these books that we already own. These are books in our collections. Why can we not digitize them? And what was finally determined with the courts is those universities that were doing that a lot, you know, with Google, yes, you can do that, but you can only do that to comply with certain federal laws. For example, comply with the federal laws that say you, know, you have to have the content available for, for students with special needs, um, as you know, have it with audiovisual material, or things in that line. So as long as the use or the digitization and the person that's going to use the digitized copy is someone that was that needed it, 
based on a, an appointment that the university has to satisfy for some federal law, then yes, that would be fair use. But if it's just digitizing for the sake of digitizing and have, making it easier and more accessible for the sake of that, then that would not be considered. Um, Patricia, so, let me inter interrupt you because I, we can see only a gray uh, square a block. Oh. We don't see the information. I don't know why. You're not seeing the presentation? Uh, now. Now we see. I'm, I can a, see it. Uh, now. now. Now we can see it. No, but the oh. people in the chat are saying that they can see it. Some of them. I'm, okay. I'm not either. Okay, now we can see it. Okay. Oh, well, sorry about Go that. Go ahead. Okay. So with the, one of the other cases um, is Cambridge University Press versus Albert, which is, and this, um, the Albert is the just university, Georgia State University, university system. And here, the case that was brought against the university by publishing companies was that the university created their own, George, George State, Georgia State University created their own version of Blackboard or Moodle was their in-house built program. And in that um, educational platform, faculty were uploading book chapters and, and uh, magazine articles and different elements, different educational material for use by the students. What the publishing company said is, university faculty, you can't do that. You can't be digitizing content and uploading to an educational platform because that's impacting my sales of the, of the books, my sales of these um, workbooks and we can't have that. I'm a publishing company. I need to make money off of this. So in this specific case, what ended up happening is the, the court evaluated the fair use components. And we're going to get into more detail later on in this webinar where we talk about fair use and I'm going to explain that further. But these are the types of controversies that universities have been faced with. It's, you know, digitizing content, uploading content for, for use by students. And one other case that I do want to bring to, to reference is this one, which is the Association for Univer Information, Media, and Equipment versus the Regents of the University of California. And here, the controversy here was that the university you can't see the information. Can you see the slide now? Yes, I can see the slide. Okay. Open. Hmm. Yeah. Something is Go happening ahead. then here. Okay. Yeah, probably it's the, um, the internet uh, mm. access of everyone. Okay, go ahead. So in this case specifically, what happened is that the university had videos. They had a library full of videos, VHS videos. And what the university wanted to do was reformat that content because, you know, there's not that many places on a, on a campus where you can watch a VHS movie because the technology, you know, that's into, by today's standard, that's obsolete technology. So they were, they were using, you know, university resources to change that content from VHS format into digital format so that it could be more accessible to the students and the university community. What happened here was that the Association for Information, Media, and Equipment said, university, you can't do that. You might own the VHS copy that you have physically in your library, but that does not give you the right to transform it from one medium to another medium. If you want to have it in a digital medium, then you have to purchase that new product in that format or acquire the license for that product in that format. Just because you have it, you have the physical component in one format does not give you the right to transform it into a new format. And that's what was the, the issue in this um, case. And we're going to talk more about these things and what you can and cannot do as we get further in into into like into um the the fair use part. So, whoops. 
So what does intellectual property consist of? As many of you might already know, intellectual property consists of anything created by a person which contains a minimum of creativity. That's all that the law requires, something created by a person with a minimum of creativity. And that expression has to be fixed on a tangible medium of expression, something that we can see, that we can perceive through our senses, that we can touch, okay? And once we, we comply with those two requirements, the creation is automatically protected under copyright law. There is not a requirement that it has to be registered at the United States Copyright Office. Once it is a creation of a human, of a person with a minimum of creativity, fixed on a tangible medium of expression, then that protection is automatic. Registration will warrant the copyright owner additional benefits, but it is not a requirement. And what are these rights that I, I keep talking about that people can or cannot do? Well, if you're the content creator or you're the owner of that copyright, you can control who does what with your work. You can control if people can or cannot reproduce the work, if they can distribute it, create derivative works, exhibit or execute it publicly. Give me one second so I can get someone to control the dog and that it won't um, bother the, the audio. Ah, the worry, the worry. It's a nice sound. <laughs> Background. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't pass that out. <laughs> Go ahead. So, with the, so, for example, when the three cases I was referring to at the beginning, the copyright owners, you know, were the, the authors or the publishing company or the creators of the videos, they are the ones that control who can or cannot reproduce the, co the, the documents. So a reproduction would be photocopying, scanning, digitizing. Those are all forms of reproduction. When we distribute something is when we upload it to Blackboard or we upload it to Moodle or whatever educational platform your institution uses. Doing that act of uploading it, that's a form of distribution. Or maybe you just email it. That is a form of distribution. So technology allows us to do these things very nonchalantly. You know, we can just do a couple of clicks, write a message, and we reproduce and we distribute without even considering the copyright implications that that might have on the institution. And the creating der derivative works would be, you know, like the University of California was doing, changing from one format to a new, to a different format. That would be, you know, we're reproducing and we're changing, we're creating a new work. And those are rights that are exclusively reserved for the copyright owner of the work. In our case, typically that would be authors, publishing companies, or content creators. And as I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes, you know, in academia, we always hear faculty saying, oh, but I only used 10% or 10 seconds, or it was less than a, a thousand words, or it was a chapter, or, or, you know, I didn't use the whole thing. Those are very common expressions that we hear from faculty. And those expressions or those, you know, what they consider to be best practices or what they do by uso y costumbre is is a very misguided notion based on fair use. There is nothing in the law that says that that use is correct or permissible. The law does not say, oh, if you only use one or two chapters or 10% of the work, you're gonna be fine. The law does not say that. So these practices that have become very commonplace in institutions are not correct. They're based on, 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 on fallacies, kind of like urban myths type of things. So those, those things are not correct. And we're going to talk a little further about what is permissible. But before we get into ironing out what we can do, there's a very important element that we do need to consider, which is that in-person education is not the same for copyright purposes as distance education. And we're going to be talking about the TEACH Act pretty soon. And we have to be very clear about 
the distinction that the law makes and the, the exceptions that the law makes for in-person education and distance education. In-person education is what we used to do pre-COVID times. So it was when we were all in a classroom with the teacher in front and the students in the room and everyone was within those four walls. That is in-person education. And the law allows a lot of flexibility as to what a teacher can do inside those four walls. It, that does not mean what they can do or what they can upload onto the Blackboard page of the course. It's what you can do inside that classroom, the information you can share, um, the movies that you can, that you can show for that in-class, in-person education setting. Now, with regards to distance education, you know, and as, as educators, I know that you'll, you know, you, you're very um, careful about the nuances that online education is not the same as asynchronous or virtual education, and there's a lot of variations in that element. But for purposes of our discussion, let's sort of lump all of that into this distance education block and be aware that there's are very two clear distinctions that the law makes of what is and what is not allowed in each one of these blocks. And in your institutions, maybe you know there's already certain guidelines of what to do or what not to do or what considerations to have. And those guidelines might, might end up looking something like this. There's a lot of flow charts and arrows as to what would be considered or not be considered fair use and if you have to ask permission or not have to ask permission and as a faculty this can be very daunting and you can be like you know I'm just not going to share anything because it's just too complicated to go through all of these boxes and and have to work on it so you're all probably you know feeling a little like this frustrated going crazy what can I do what can I not do but it does not have to be that complicated it's a four, you know, you can have a four step process to this, which simplifies everything. And these, this four, four set pro, four step process is what the, is based on the fair use exception and what the law has determined that it will consider or it will evaluate in a fair use um, cases. And these four, four items are based from those uh, three cases that I mentioned at the beginning of, of the webinar against the university. So first of all, we need to consider what is the nature of the work? Is the work that as a faculty member you intend to share with your students or you intend to upload to your group uh, portal, to your class portal in Blackboard, is the nature of the work a creative work? Is it a fiction or nonfiction? The more the work is creative if it's a not if it's a fiction piece of work the more creative the work the less the fair use um the less it will be considered fair use the the less creative you know it's a non-fiction book if it's a history book if it's a science book um the 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 more non-fiction it is then you know the more you're going to be able to use it and the more you're going to be able to share it with the students. So number one, we have to know what is the nature of the work? Is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it a creative work? So the higher the, the creativity is on the work, the less probability it's going to be fair use. So we, it, this is all going to be a balancing act, as you're going to see. And then we also have to consider what is the purpose of the work, of the use? Why do you as a faculty member want to share this with your students? Is it, is it um, for additional information? Is it to replace them having to buy a textbook or having to buy the book? What is the purpose or nature of sharing this with them? Number three, what is the amount of the work to be used? Are you gonna be sharing a chapter out of a 1,000 chapter book? Are you gonna be sharing a couple of pages? Is it the whole thing? Patricia. Uh, Sonia Abel asks if she can share a poem created by a student in one course with students from another course, for example. Well, in that in those scenarios, it depends sometimes on the what the institutional policy is about 
sharing works created by students, sharing with different groups works created by students. And so it would go down to what that policy is. Um, and if we're going to share something with a different group, it's always preferable to get that student's permission. You know, just let them know that I really like this and I would like to share it with other groups, maybe sharing it so they know, you know, this is what an excellent job looks like. So it all depends on what that sharing aspect would consist of. Now, back to this four, four step process. Thank you. you. Need to figure out de nada what that amount copied is. And then the last thing we need to consider is what is the market impact? How is our use going to impact that um, publisher's sales of the book? So these are the four things we need to consider when we do a fair use analysis. And for example, if we're going to upload content to Blackboard or Moodle or whatever um, educational platform the students use, maybe it's Plus Portal or, or different platforms that are currently out there, we can't upload a whole book. We can't digitize a whole book and upload it just so that this make it easier for the students and the student doesn't have to have to spend the money in purchasing the book. If we do that, that will be a direct violation of, of fair use and copyright law. It's like, you know, if you're playing Monopoly, go directly to jail, do not pass go, and do not collect $200. It's, you know, there are certain things that are just a complete clear violation, and that would be an example of that. Um, but we do have to be mindful in that analysis of these four elements. So what is the nature of the work? Why is it that we want to share it? What is the amount to be covered? And what would be the impact on the sales of that component? Now, moving on to what the TEACH Act allows us to do for distance education. Uh, oh, I have a question of what if the book is out of print? If the book is out of print, it depends. Is it, is it out of print just because it is an old copy of a book and it's no longer being published? Or is it out of print because the publisher decided, nope, you know, I'm not, there's a new version of the book, there's a revised edition. So if it's out of print, we need to know why is that out of print? Is it a book that was published in 1920 and it's no longer in print? That book is probably, the copyright term of that book probably expired already and it would be in the public domain and it would, we would be able to use it. But we're going to talk that, about that shortly. So coming back to the TEACH Act, which is the Technology, Education and Copyright Harmonization Act, this was an attempt in the 2000s to sort of have copyright law catch up with technology. And this law sets out clear guidelines as to what can and cannot be done for distance education. And remember, when I mentioned earlier, in in-person education does not equal distance education. It's not the same as in that box of distance education. We're lumping in asynchronous, online, and we're just sort of lumping all of that in there for purposes of this discussion. I know that you are all very, very well aware of the different nuances between each one, but for purposes of simplification, let's just sort of lump that in. I know some of you might be cringing, but sorry about that. So in-person education, there's a lot of freedom as to what can be done. When we are in distance education, the law starts getting stricter and stricter as to what can be done. And the law sets out basically certain requirements, and those requirements we can lump into three different categories. The first set of requirements is for the institution, and these are the requirements that the institution per se has to fulfill. For example, the institution has to be an accredited nonprofit educational institution. The institution has to have and disseminate to the faculty and to the students a copyright policy. And when the information or the content is shared with students through educational platforms, there has to be a copyright notice on the materials. Copyright notice saying that this content may be protected or subject to copyright law or copyright protection, do not copy, that type of language. 
So those are requirements for the institution. There's also another set of requirements that the university or the institution has to meet that have to do with technological requirements. And some of these requirements are that the university has to adopt those technological requirements that ensure that the material or the content uploaded on that platform is only, only accessible to the students enrolled in that course. So we have, you know, a history class for fall semester 2020. When we go to history class fall um, spring semester 2021, the students enrolled in the spring semester 2021 class do not have access to the content of fall course and vice versa. Fall students do not have access to the content of the class in the spring semester. So the university has to ensure that it has those technological requirements in place. And the university is also has to make sure that the technological requirements it has in place are, you know, they're, they're pretty good, that they go merely just having a username and password. The university maybe needs to adopt um, technological measures to ensure, you know, what are the IP addresses to make sure that, that one is related to the other. And but just go beyond just the password. So those are, you know, some of the requirements re required for institutions. Now there's another set of requirements for the instructor of the course. And these consist with what is being shared and w why and what is being shared. So first of all, the instructor has to make sure that the content he or she wants to share is an integral part is integral to the class instruction of what we're going to be cover. And if that, that content that is going to be shared and that it is integral to the class instruction, it can be used for live, sort of kind of like what we're doing now, for live sessions or asynchronous settings. So it covers, it, it, you know, it covers a lot. And the content that that instructor is sharing has to be content that is not created for online educational purposes. So for example, I have a physical book with me and I'm gonna digitize a couple of chapters for my students to view that they can have access to. Well, that book, there could not be a digital copy of that book already in the market. The, the publishing company cannot have licenses to that digital book or the, or the university library cannot have a license to a digital copy because if that content already exists in digital format and there are licenses available for that content in digital format, then the Teach Act will not apply to that content. What we can share is material that is not, in, that is not available in digital content or not marketed for the digital education purposes. So let me ask, was that clear? Questions on that? Yes, students do know where to download books for free. They know where to get the, the materials for free and chapters. And students will all have always known and will always know where to get that or the PDF version of the book. But that's on the student. That's not, this is what you as a faculty member and you as an institution can and cannot do. What the student does or how the student access other materials, that's on them and that's not gonna, it's not gonna fall on the university's responsibility. So right now we're focusing on what's the responsibility of the university and the faculty of what can and cannot be done. What students do is, is on them. So there are certain things to which we must be aware that the TEACH Act will not extend to. For example, if as a faculty you have course packs or there are interlibrary loans, the TEACH Act will not apply to that. We cannot have course acts available on the educational platform. And you know, if we're gonna have something on library reserves or e-reserves, we have to make sure that the library has, has the corresponding licenses or that us as a faculty provide the library with the information that they need to be able to put that on e-reserves or have the digital licenses for that. 
um, we cannot share things from commercial libraries. And as I keep mentioning in, in different moments, we cannot convert things from one format to another format just to make it kind of easier. And if the content was created for digital use, we need those digital licenses. So what are some of the steps, oops, what are some of the, of the steps that as a university we can take? What are those actionable steps that we need or must take to be protected under the TEACH Act? Well, first of all, as a university, you need to create a copyright policy if you do not already have one and disseminate that copyright policy. Make sure that you give those trainings or information, edu you know, in, um, informational sessions to faculty that they know what it is, they know what it applies to, and they are aware that it exists and that the university has one. That not, will not only help you in these type of scenarios, but it will also help you when you're trying to get um, accredited by the accrediting institutions like middle states and others. Ensure, the faculty must ensure that the content that they are sharing was legally acquired. If we're gonna show a movie in an in-person class setting, make sure it's a legally acquired copy of the movie, that it's not a bootleg copy that you bought at the flea market, okay? So make sure that the content you're sharing is legally acquired. Establish guidelines and best practices for, for the faculty so that they know, you know, what can be done in certain scenarios. Also, administrators, they should be aware of what can and cannot be done, what is um, allowed and not. Because sometimes faculty, we, the faculty world and the administrative world, they're sometimes talking in different languages and administrators need to be aware of what the you know the limitations on the faculty as to what can and cannot be shared because if not administrators might be expecting too much and faculty might be saying well I you know fair use I can't do this and the administrators don't quite understand that you need to purchase certain licenses if you want me to share this content we need to get the licenses and that's something that the administrators need to get so make sure that those conversations in your institutions are being had to avoid these types of um, issues. And with that, I think we are sort of on time to keep answering those questions that I know have been, pop been um, popping up. Here is my contact information if, um, so that you can reach me as needed. And uh, Joel, please, let's see what questions they might have. Then maybe I haven't discussed. Hi, hello, I'm back. I yes. was mute. <laughs> I was start talking. I forgot I was. I was mute. Sorry. And Carlos is here too. Well, I have seen. I I don't know. It's sorry, game. I have a, a phone call that I have to attend. A a Dr. Jamie Jasmine Cruz preguntó que she, she can use a chapter. Did you answer that question already, right? Um, if you can okay, use the chapter. Uh -huh. you, I mean, it all, you can use it, uh, for example, if that, if that textbook is, there's not a digital version of the textbook, then yes, you can digitize that chapter and make it available. But if that textbook, if there's a, a digital version of it for which licenses are, are required, then no, you cannot share it. The university would need to purchase the corresponding licenses. Yeah. So that it, that answered your question, I guess. Uh, just me. Okay, yeah. She said thanks. Um, my professor Marcos Torres. Hola, professor. He said applies the ten percent rule. I guess talking about no. that same question. The the ten percent rule is those the. The 10% rule, the one chapter, or the five seconds, those those um, concepts that faculty had before, that was based on certain guidelines, fair use guidelines that were provided to Congress in the 70s, uh, with the hope that they would become part of the law. But those guidelines were never approved by Congress, and somehow that document sort of got out into the public, and people were using those as, oh, you know, this would be a safe haven of what can and cannot be done. 
but there's no legal basis for that. So those are misconceptions that have been carried over for decades with zero legal foundation. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Any other question? You can use the chat and also since the group is not that big, he says um, well, a lot of people, but not, not that much. Hey, we, you can activate the microphone. Jelica, if they can activate their microphone to ask questions. Yes, they can. They they can do it. Okay. So if you have any question, you can raise your hand and activate your microphone or use the chat. Bueno, Otoniel said for restricting the copied material to the course said. Ah, oh, bueno, uh, he he uh, he said, can I use images from an electronic book for which the university have licenses? Yes. Yes, uh -huh. if the university if the university has the licenses to the content through the library or or you know the library has a, an image libraries or video library, yes, you can do that and you can link to those because the university is already paying for those resources. But if the university if what the university has is a is a move for example a, a movie library on VHS, then the university cannot. Um, transform that content in VHS to digital, you know, to DVR digital content. That would not be allowed. But if, if it's already in digital content and there's licenses, yes. See, sí. so there's a. Uh -huh, William, is that the one you're reading? Uh, sí. uh -huh. So there's a question of um, when are, for how long are copyrights um, available? So the thing with copyrights, and I never really want to say, oh, it's this amount of years, because there have been a lot of different copyright laws in place, mm -hmm. and each law modified the amount of years or changed the requirements needed for, for, or you know, requirements needed for the for the work to be copyright protected. So at the end of the day, it all depends on the law that was the law in place at the time the work was created. So if we're talking about a work created in the year 2000, then it's the copyright law that we have in place now, and protection term would be the life of the author plus 75 years. But if we're talking about a work that was created in 1930, then we have to go to the law that was in place in 1930 to see what the copyright requirements were then and if the author complied with those or not to know if the work is copyright protected or not. So it gets a bit tricky. See, sí, there is another you question you? that, hey, uh -huh. can, I, can I ask can I one as you, as you hey. prepare the next one? Uh, mm -hmm. Patricia, so, you know, I, I know that you mentioned um, Teach Act and all those elements, but um, I, um, the, the little I know on this topic, um, I think that, you know, there is a portion of what we do that leverages or uses or is dependent uh, on copyright law, but there is also a part that uh, uh, is governed by Teach Act and uh, another part by Fair Use. Is that is that a correct understanding? Yes, it's all fair use and it's all part of copyright law, so it's all sort of englobado uh -huh. under, under, what, under what is copyright law. And fair use, fair use is sort of an exception. It's sort of um, when we want to pedir perdón en vez de pedir permiso. Mm -hmm. eh, so, so that's when we use the phrase, it's like, oh, I already did the use, so let's see if it falls under fair use or not. So fair use is an exception or a defense that we use after the fact. So, but there, you know, as technology advances, it would be less and less things would fall under fair use for academic purposes. And the, that's something that the Teach Act tried to do. It's like, well, let's, through the Teach Act, let's sort of say what, these are the things or these are the scenarios in which university can share or provide information online if they comply with these requirements. You know, that it's accredited university, it's nonprofit, they have the technological measures in place to ensure that not everyone's going to have access to that content, just the students in that course. So it's sort of a, it's a way of trying to, to, to evolve law into today's technological um, okay. playing field. 
the the other question uh, um, that comes to mind to to what extent um, and again um, I'm just asking as a, as a normal user for for I forget about my role with heads um, do you think that is a good practice to I don't know send these students to for example if if there is I don't know a popular movie that um, you know we need a clip for the class, you know, I don't know, two minutes or whatever it is. is. Is it a good practice to send the students to, I don't know, a Netflix account, you know, for them to use that and, and use that source as an information rather than, or, or the faculty member actually, uh, rather than, uh, uh, you know, these other tricks of YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, if we want to use a small video clip or audio clip, yes, we would be able to, to incorporate that. In most, you know, maybe the library has a license to that movie and we can just sort of edit, you know, and have that clip that we want to or make reference to that movie. But for example, um, something that cannot be done is if I want to show a movie in class, I as a faculty member would not be able to use my personal Netflix account to show the movie mm -hmm. in class. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can tell us too, I would be able to tell the students, you know, you can, you, for more information, go watch this movie, and it is available on Netflix or Hulu or or wherever. But I would not be able to to show it through my personal Netflix account. Okay. I would be able if the if the library had the licenses. I would be able to stream it through university, through the university, but with the licenses already that the university had in place for that. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you. There is a, sí, I, I eh, guess, as you said, get, go ahead, go ahead, Yubalkis. No, okay, I saw another, I put a question in a chat, and the people is already asking me about if they think this is going to be pertinent to, for next semester, coordinate uh, training. Uh, it could be by collaborate two or three hours, because one hour is not enough, so we can clarify a lot of the doubts and and of course that will be a formal training like the one we did with Dr. Dietmar Kennepol uh, with registration fee and everything with the certificate of, of, of continuing it included so uh, and the people are saying yes but I see some questions that I'm not sure that you already answered like uh, well uh, we already uh, one people took uh, ask what to book we are talking about, and we already mentioned that is the one that you show in the screen, Los Derechos del Autor, que Professor Marcos Torres dice que está free of charge in Kindle Unlimited. I don't know, no sé, eh, Patricia, if you know the, the cost in the Kindle, in the regular Kindle, eh, to um, download I the book. I, uh, I believe that the regular Kindle is $9.99 and there's also a paperback version for in, in the, in the okay. Amazon store, I think $30, $35. Perfect. Entonces, eh, el mismo profesor Marcos Torres, saludo profesor de nuevo, pregunta que si there is any new courts ruling that applies to distant education. No, it's it's more it's basically what we the three the most important ones are the three that i mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, it's sort of you know the teach act and these things are sort of trying to move forward so um there is a no that mainly it's those three and how they how the court would interpret them with distance distance learning Ok, entonces, to clarify the DAO Prenda Corchado, el recording de este workshop will be available in the same page that you register in webinars in English. You will see all the repository of all the webinars that we have offered in English, and the same for the one in Spanish. Each uh, language have their page, and you can go through head services. Uh, I mean, heads.org, in the main menu, head services, you will see uh, on their professional development events, you will see heads webinar in English and webinars in Spanish, and also you will see the webinars for students. All these three pages have all the repository of all the webinars that we have offered during this semester. And remember that if you need the certificate of participation, send us an email to info at heads.org before you go. Uh, you have seven days to do that, and then in seven days we prepare the list and we send it.
uh, the week after. So in the next two weeks, you will be receiving the certificates. Let me see if I have any other, thank you for answering me the questions. So everybody said that they think it's appropriate to have a training on this topic. Mm -hmm. Entonces, ah, mira, eh, dicen que sí que están $10 in the Kindle, in the regular Kindle, so you can download the, the book, buy the book there. Any other question? I don't see, I think we cover all the questions. Eh, Carlos, I don't know. You have I, saw, I, saw there was, I saw there was a question about what a, um, a faculty creating a, a course where the copyrights, who do, if I understood correctly, it's, for create when you create a course, who do the copyrights belong to? The faculty or the university? Maybe that's where the question was headed. I think. I think um, that in was. Those, in those cases, it you know it depends on two things. Number one, it depends on the contract between the faculty mm -hmm. member and the institution and what that contract says. And Sorry. also, if the university, and secondly, if the contract doesn't say anything, then if the university has an intellectual property policy or copyright policy, what does that cop what does that policy say? If there is nothing under either, you know, if there's not a contract or the contract doesn't say anything, and there is not an intellectual property policy or copyright policy saying something to that effect, then Copyright ownership would be on the faculty member that created the, the course. So first we have to look at the contract, then if there's a policy, and if there's nothing, then it would be on the on the professor. Okay, great. Okay, for mm -hmm. Hello. We wait for a we hope that you can join us a, on December 4 for our last webinar of this semester. Así que, thank you so much, Carlos. If you want to add something else. Yes, someone I, else I have just a question? Say, yes, I just want to say, well, first of all, thanks to everybody that uh, came to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, certainly very lively discussion. And uh, this, this is a topic that, you know, we need, we need maybe a whole day uh, to to discuss simply because you know there are so many uh, variants if you will uh, and applicability because of the uh, uniqueness of certain activities we do and again we are uh, 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 recognizing that diversity of activities i want to thank um, uh, patricia uh, for her availability this afternoon and as always you know this is a topic that is very informative i i keep updating my knowledge on, on this one, so thank, thank you for her availability and and for sharing with us a uh, pretty much what what is up to date on this particular topic and and of course to the heads team for uh, their uh, collaboration to plan this a uh, workshop and the tech checks and the preparation preparatory meetings and everything so thanks everybody for for all that I don't have anything Gee, else if, um, if not we are adjourned yeah, well I, I so I saw Sergio Lara from Mexico that I only mentioned Buenos Aires, Argentina, because that was the one that uh, come up in the registration uh, list, but I saw Sergio from Mexico. Un saludo, and thank you for everyone from the States, from international members and um, institutions, and also from Puerto Rico for being here. And please follow us in the social media. We will be sharing the link to the recording there and also in our website uh, depending what you prefer and thank you again and thank you patricia it have been a pleasure collaborating with you in this thank you so much for that excellent uh powerpoint and i will done a uh, if you can send that to me my email in pdf yes. format it will be great so we can share it with everyone uh, on the same web page that they registered with the link of the recording, okay? So Perfect. thank you so much. Have thank a you wonderful everyone. day thank and thank you. And yes, and we will be coordinating next uh, webinars for next semester, and, and we will let you know in, yes, as always in you. next events. You will see all the new dates yes. and this webinar also. Thank you. Saludos, Elsa from Argentina. Have been a, hola, saludos, and thank you. Everyone, thank you, Carlos. Okay. Thank Gracias. you, Patricia. Bye -bye. Again. Okay.
Gracias, Jelisa. Gracias, bye bye. Okay, have a, have a good day.